Well, it's my great privilege to be able to be with you on the first day of the first week of 12 weeks of studying through the Bible. A very rapid treatment, obviously. I've taught in uh, YWAM SBSs, which go through the Bible in nine months, and that is even too quick. Uh, although I'm a little more accustomed to that, because for 16 years I ran a school in Oregon that was a nine-month nine school, and we went through a whole Bible each year for 16 years. Uh, so I've lectured on all the books of the Bible, verse by verse. Uh, my website is thenarrowpath.com, and you can listen to any of those lectures for free, uh, verse by verse, through any book of the Bible, as well as many hundreds of uh, topical teachings. I began teaching when I was younger than any of you. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home, and when I was 16, it was 1970, and the Jesus movement uh, began. And it began right around the place I was living. Actually, it probably began in 69. It was around January of 70 when I first discovered the Jesus movement was happening in a church about 10 miles or so from where I was living. And uh, that was Calvary Chapel of Costa Mesa. And I started going there. And um, I went there for many years. And because I'd been a Christian all my life, and I had actually begun to study the Bible, but not very much in depth in my younger years, I didn't really understand the Bible very much, but I, I had read it enough to have familiarity with it. Uh, I was asked by my own schoolmates in high school if I would teach them the Bible at, at noon, because the Jesus movement was happening and there were lots and lots of young people my age who were suddenly coming to Christ from a totally non-Christian background and without any background in scripture they needed, or they wanted insight, they wanted teaching. So I began to do that when I was uh, 16, and when I got out of high school, I was uh, able to continue in that ministry and for several different uh, churches and organizations. I've never really been on staff anywhere. I'm not actually a YWAM, I've been teaching for 36 years in YWAM. I've never done a DTS myself, I've never joined YWAM. Um, I've never, as I said, been part of any organization, even my own school. Uh, I was just a volunteer, even though I started the school, I, I just volunteered for various churches and organizations. Uh, that's just one of my convictions. I don't, uh, I don't believe in making a, a job out of the ministry. I just, uh, when I was 17, I got out of high school and started teaching and traveling. And, and uh, I've done nothing else but teach the Bible pretty much since then. For the past 21 years, I've had a daily radio program in the United States. I don't know how many stations we're on. We're approximately 30 stations right now and um, in, in various parts of the country. And it's an hour a day, every, every week day in the afternoon. I uh, have an open phone line to talk show, an open phone line for people to call in and ask Bible questions. So I've been doing that an hour a day for 21 years. But I actually was answering Bible questions for people a long time before I had the radio show because in the Jesus movement, because there were so many young people converts my age uh, who had questions. I was asked by a certain ministry that was reaching out to those people to teach once a week, or actually to have a question and answer session once a week. So when I was 17, I started answering people's Bible questions for them. Obviously, I didn't know uh, very much about some of the things, but I've never felt there's anything wrong with saying I don't know. And if you have any questions, by the way, and you will, uh, during my lecture or afterward, I'm, I'm always glad to have you, you know, ask them. You can ask me at lunchtime, at dinner time. Um, it's possible that I can arrange after each lecture on each of the books we're covering to actually have a, a session or a portion of the time at the end where you can ask questions about it. Because you should have questions. And as you read and study the books of the Bible that you're studying this, uh, this next three months, uh, you should write down the questions you have so that you can ask them. Uh, and I, I just, I, I don't, mind answering any question that I can. And if I can't answer it again, I won't pretend that I can. Well, you're going to be studying in the next two weeks, and I'll be here for these two weeks, uh, the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, sometimes called the, the books of Moses. The Jews call it the Torah, which means the law. And you're also going to study Job, and we're going to take portions of Hebrews as we look at Leviticus, because Hebrews is often referred to as a New Testament commentary on Leviticus. That's a little bit of an overstatement. There is 
very significant commentary on uh, Leviticus and Hebrews, but there's more in Hebrews than simply that. But the uh, we'll look at all of that uh, this week. Now, I'm accustomed to going verse by verse in my lectures uh, that I did in my school. We won't do anything like that because we'll have to take like Genesis in a day, <laughs> you know, Exodus in a day, Job in a day, or approximately. And um, so we'll, we'll have sort of an overview and an introduction to these books, and I'll be glad to take any questions you have because you'll be reading them prior to our studying them together here. Today I'm going to not actually begin teaching Genesis. I'm going to begin talking about some more fundamental things. Since this is your first day of a three-month lecture phase, uh, there's some things we want to talk about right from the beginning. And we will look at the beginning in Genesis chapter 1. I understand you're using the, uh, the New Living Translation. And so I've got that here on my iPad. Just a few verses at the beginning of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was empty, a formless mass cloaked in darkness, and the Spirit was hovering over its surface. Um, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that it was good. Then he separated the light from the darkness. He called the light day, the darkness night. Together these made up day. And God said, let there be a space between the waters, to separate the water from the water, it was so, and God made the space to separate the waters above from the waters below, and God said, uh, he called the space sky, this happened on the second day, and God let the waters beneath the sky be gathered into one place, a great, uh, so that ground, dry ground may appear, I've got a problem here, if I turn it this way, I can see the whole, <laughs> the whole thing, I'm missing some words here, what's wrong, okay, um, then God said, let the land burst forth, every sort of grass and seed bearing plant, and so forth and so forth, and it was so. And we keep seeing this in verse 12, again, at the end of verse 12, and God saw that it was good. And we see that again and again, that whatever God made, he said it was good. Actually, when he has it all done, he says it's very good. Mm -hmm. So God did good work. But the rather than talking about this chapter in detail right now, I want to talk about some of the implications this chapter has for uh, forming a proper worldview. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with the word worldview. Lots of people talk about worldviews these days. It's kind of an academic subject, but it's really something that you don't have to be an academic to, uh, to need to understand. Everyone needs to understand what a worldview is. And a worldview basically is a set of assumptions that form your outlook on the nature of reality, the nature of the world, the universe, a set of assumptions. Now I say assumptions, I would have said a set of beliefs, but it's not even quite so much as just assumptions. Everybody has assumptions about the way the world is, how it got to be this way, what life is about, what, what we're supposed to do about it, how we're supposed to live. The answers to those kinds of questions combine to form what we call a worldview. And it's very important that you are aware that you have a worldview. Everyone has one, but not everyone is aware of theirs because a worldview is not something you look at so much, although we will be looking at worldviews today. But most of the time, you're not looking at the worldview, you're looking through it. You see everything through a grid. Like, I don't see my glasses when I'm wearing them. I'm looking through my glasses, but they bring my awareness of the vis visual world to my eyes because I'm, if I didn't have them, everything would be blurred. And so also the set of assumptions that you bring to life and the worldview that they form uh, is something you look at everything through, you assess everything through. Now most people, as I said, don't even know what their worldview is, because and some don't even know what the word means. It's not a biblical word, so it's, it's just a useful word. A worldview answers some very important ultimate questions, all the important questions of life. And there are different worldviews. We're going to look at some of the different worldviews and see what Genesis has to tell us about the correct one. The questions that a worldview concerns itself with are the ultimate questions like this. What is the ultimate reality? Now, obviously, uh, Genesis says 
God was there first. God made everything. And that's why we would call him the ultimate reality. He was there first. He's the thing that is a given. Before there's anything else, and without justifying the existence of anything else, there is one thing that is fundamental. Now, we believe it's God. The Bible assumes it's God. It's interesting how the book of Genesis doesn't make any arguments for God. The book doesn't say, now, I know you're probably wondering if there's a God, but let me make a case for theism. <laughs> because, frankly, at the time that Moses wrote this, there were no atheists. Every, well, there might have been some secret atheists, but basically every society believed in deities. Israel had Yahweh as their deity. The Egyptians had their gods. The Canaanites had their gods. <clears throat> there wasn't really, atheism really wasn't uh, fashionable in those ancient times. But the interesting thing is, belief in Yahweh wasn't particularly fashionable either. Yahweh was uniquely the God of Israel. And again, Moses doesn't make any arguments for the existence of Yahweh or of God. He just starts out in the meaning God did these things. Now that's obvious that Moses is assuming the existence of God. Of course, he had better reason than most to assume it. He saw God on Mount Sinai. <laughs> <laughs> but, but many people who've never seen God uh, assume his existence too. I do. That's part of my worldview. There is a God. But there are other worldviews out there. Of course, the naturalistic worldview, which we'll talk about later on, believes that the universe is all there is. And uh, that's what, for example, atheists say. There's nothing else except the universe. The laws of nature govern the universe. And it came about just uh, from a, a singularity called the Big Bang. No one knows why it happened. No one, uh, that is to say, they can't say why there is something rather than nothing. But there is something. They know that. There is a universe out there. And as far as they're concerned, that's the ultimate reality. There never was anything before the universe. And there's nothing more ultimate than the universe. And that means that all of the universe and all humans are the products of the universe, the products of natural laws. Acting. The same kinds of natural laws that brought the universe into being in the Big Bang have been at work in the universe, creating planets and systems and uh, living things and us. And so this is the ultimate reality for, the, for, for some people. We believe God is the ultimate reality. Some people believe the universe is. Now, in the Eastern religions, there's an ultimate reality called Dharma, which is spelled D-H-A-R-M-A. -A. So there's an H in there you wouldn't know about. Dharma, D-H-A-R-M-A. Dharma in Hinduism and in Buddhism and in Sikhism, <coughs> Eastern religions in general, mostly the religions of India, uh, is the order of the universe, basically. And it includes things like duties and rights and laws and virtues and what right behavior is. I'll give you those again. The order in the universe, which makes actually existence possible, is dharma, they say. And dharma is a, is a principle that includes duties, rights, laws, virtues, and principles of right living. Now, that sounds a lot like God, actually. But in the Eastern religions, there isn't really a God, such as we know. Buddhism doesn't necessarily believe in God at all. The Buddha was apparently an atheist. Mm -hmm. And Hinduism, which was Buddha branched off of Hinduism, but Hinduism believes there's gazillions of gods, in, innumerable gods, but they're, none of them are really God, like we think of. They're more like what the Bible might recognize as demonic beings. And you can, if you've ever seen statues of some of the, the gods of the Hindus, you understand why the Jews consider those gods to be demons. Um, but none of those gods really deserve the title God because they are themselves products of, of whatever, of the universe. They, none of them are the creators of it. So the Eastern religions don't believe in a God. They believe the ultimate reality is something called Dharma, which is impersonal. It's as impersonal as the, uh, impersonal as the laws of gravity. It has... Uh, it dictates, but it doesn't do something from a mind. It's not conscious. It's just something like 
laws of physics or something, although it isn't the laws of physics, it's something more transcendent. Now that's, if you say, well, that's a little hard to understand, it is. It is hard to understand, and in the Eastern religions, understanding it isn't the priority. But um, just having something that really plays the role of God, that isn't personal, is really the point, I think, of Dharma. Because it's not personal, it doesn't, you can't have a relationship with God, but you can obey the principles and the duties and, and, and recognize the rights of men and so forth that Dharma somehow dictates. But how a non-personal, non-mind dictates anything is something that I don't think anyone has ever been able to explain yet. In any case, your worldview, first of all, starts with what you believe the ultimate reality is. If you believe there's a God, then you that's a distinctive of your worldview. There are people who don't believe there's a God, and they have other alternatives that start out their thinking. A second thing, of course, that your worldview includes is what you think about origins. And this is going to be related to the first thing, because whatever is the first thing must have originated whatever else there is. So the origins of temporal things, the origins of planets and life and things like that, uh, must have come from whatever is before that, whatever was ultimate, whatever was original. And so those who believe in God can believe, and usually do, believe that the creation is uh, something that he invented, like a work of art. It came out of his creativity, out of his mind, and, and that he had the power to bring it into being, so that we are all created by God according to uh, what we would call a theistic worldview, a belief in God. It's called theism. It's like atheism without the A. Atheism <laughs> is a belief in no God, and theism is a belief in God. So theism <clears throat> is a worldview that would say that God is the originator of everything. Now, not all theists would have the same opinion about exactly how God <laughs> brought everything about. Some actually would believe, there are, there are theists who believe in theistic evolution, believe that God used a process of evolution Others believe, as I do, that he used a process that's described in Genesis of special creation. You can be a theist and have a different view about how he did things. Ultimately, what makes you a theist is that you believe that whoever did it is a theist, is a theos. Theos is the Greek word for God, that there's a God there. Now, those who don't believe in uh, God generally believe that the origin of things is pretty much accidental. Uh, the Big Bang wasn't called for by anybody. It was just an accident. What made it happen? Nobody knows. But since it began to happen, natural laws took over, and fortuitous accidents brought about solar systems and, and living systems and things that in our environment that make it possible for us to live, air to breathe, which most planets don't have. Most planets don't have water. You know, some of the things absolutely necessary to life are found on this planet. Even the distance we are from the sun, they say if it was a little bit closer, a little bit further, no living thing as we know it could survive on Earth. There's, there's, some people refer to the Earth as a privileged planet, and sometimes people call it the Goldilocks effect. That, you know, Goldilocks, it, it, the pores that she ate was not too hot or too cold, it was just right. And the Goldilocks effect is, is something scientists have spoken of as describing the situation the Earth is in. The only planet that we know of that has life on it. If there's life on other planets, we are not aware of it. And we are aware of a lot in the universe, but not, of course, there's many things we aren't aware of. But as far as we know, this planet is the only planet in existence that can sustain life, carbon-based life as we are and, and as we know it, which, as I said, needs an atmosphere, air, uh, needs water, needs a number of chemicals and, and enough heat and enough coolness and so forth and enough gravitational force to just make things work right. And, uh, and the Earth just fits in that little narrow zone there where we're able to be, live here. Now some people say God made it that way. That's the worldview of theism. Those who don't believe in theism believe it just, it's just an accident that it happened this way. There are other planets that accidentally didn't get those benefits, and so there's no life on them, but we accidentally got them. And so, uh, the, 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 what you think of origins is one of the things that you're going to be deriving from your worldview. If you believe there's a God, you probably believe in creation in some sort. If you don't believe in God, you'll have some other view about 
origins, but it'll have to do with some accidents of nature, more or less. Of course, your worldview is going to talk to you about what is the purpose of existence? What is the purpose of life? Now, honestly, I can't think of there being a purpose of life that has any teeth in it, any, any uh, relevance, unless you have a God. If God made things, if he originated things, if he's the creator, if he's creative, if he, like, like we're creative, we write stories, we write songs, we do artwork, uh, we're creative people. Uh, when a person makes a work of art or invents a machine or something, they do it for a reason. It's not just because they don't have anything to do, it's because they, are, they have something conceptualized in their mind. If they do a piece of art, it's either to communicate something or to bring pleasure to, you have a reason for doing it. It might be a very simple reason, but it's a reason. You don't, intelligent beings don't create things for nothing, for no reason. A person who's, who's a scientist invents, you know, useful gadgets or things that are necessary. They do it for a reason. There's a purpose for that computer you have, for that phone you have, for the light bulbs. Whoever invented those did it because they thought it was useful. They had a purpose for it. Now, therefore, a theistic worldview holds that there is some purpose for our existence. Once again, anything that's not a theistic worldview can't really give any convincing ideas about why there would be a purpose. If we're just an accident of nature, we don't have any purpose for existence. Now, atheists say, well, no, that's not true. You, you theists aren't the only people who can have purpose. We can have purpose, too, as atheists. We can live for the good of humanity. We can live for the good of society. Well, yes, you can. You can adopt some purpose, an arbitrary purpose, but there, if there's no God, then there's no reason for anyone to think that your, the purpose you've adopted is really has any uh, validity at all. If there's no God, why should I believe that I should serve humanity? Why shouldn't I just be a narcissistic, selfish pig? Why shouldn't I just live for myself? After all, if evolution is true, isn't that what all the other species do? Isn't that what life is about in the evolutionary scheme of things? Survival of the fittest? If I happen to be healthy and strong and have some money and I can get by, and I see someone else who's not healthy, not strong, they have no money, why should I help them? Survival of this, I happen to be fitter than they are. Shouldn't natural selection just eliminate them? What argument can possibly be made for having a purpose in life of helping other people, unless there's something more to life than just survival because of the natural instincts for survival and the natural selective process of evolution? There is no, I mean, anyone who's not, an, a, a, not a believer in God can adopt arbitrarily some purpose. Say, my purpose in life is to be rich. My purpose in life is to be happy. My purpose in life is to make other people happy. My purpose of life is to, uh, is to do very little work and have other people support me. You know, there, you can adopt any number of purposes, but to say that's that's the purpose of existence, well, only in your own brain is it, your, is it the purpose of existence. No one else has to believe that's the purpose of life. But if there's a God, then there is a transcendent purpose. God had a purpose. God made the world because he wanted it to be a certain way. God made people because he wanted them to do a certain thing. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of life is to fit into the will of God in these areas. So theistic worldview suggests there is a purpose. Whereas anything else, uh, you know, any purpose that a person may want to adopt is an arbitrary thing. It's not transcendent. It's not something that stands above and, and has some kind of bearing and authority over our lives. Now, all those things we've talked about so far, we can get directly from Genesis chapter 1. We see that there's a God who was here before anything else was here. So he's the ultimate reality. Uh, he created the universe by speaking into existence. So the origin of things is creation. Uh, there's, we could uh, assume there must be a purpose. Uh, the, it doesn't really say in Genesis at this point what the purpose was that God had in making the world, but that is revealed in, in other parts of Scripture. But even at the beginning, we could assume if God's making something, he must have a reason for it. He's not just remaining uh, in, uh, you know, inactive throughout all eternity. Uh, He's, he's doing something. He's, he's getting something done. And, and if you're getting something done, you're starting with 
a point where it isn't done to a point where it is, and you've got to have a purpose for taking those steps. And so you could derive the understanding simply from Genesis 1 that the world exists for a purpose, although its purpose is not yet revealed in Genesis 1. It does come out later in Scripture. Another question that different worldviews answer differently is a matter of values. What some things are more valuable than other things. You see this brought out a lot in, for example, the book of Proverbs, where it says, uh, better is uh, a dry crust of bread where love is than a great feast where there's hatred. Mm -hmm. Now, whenever, and there's lots of Proverbs that begin with, better is this than that. Mm -hmm. Better is a, it's better to live in the corner of a house tunnel than in a white house with a argumentative what, you know, I mean, yeah. Solomon has a lot of these kind of statements, right? And so, but to say something is better than something else means you have a, a hierarchy of values. This is good, this is less good. This is more desirable, this is less desirable. Some things that are, you know, less good might even be very evil. And so there's good and evil. And there's a whole range of a hierarchy of values from that which is very evil to that which is very good. Some things are better than others, some are worse than others. But what determines that? What determines values? What determines what's good and bad, right and wrong? Now, of course, the theistic worldview has a very simple answer, the will of God. God who made us has a purpose for us to be a certain way. It's, he intends for us to be that way. If we are, then that's good. If we aren't, well, in his mind, that's bad. And if it's bad in his mind, that's just bad. It's wrong. There are things that God values more than other things. He, he values humility more than he values uh, you being a wealthy person, for example. The Proverbs says that too. The Bible brings a lot of those kinds of things up. It's very clear, for example, in the law that God gives in Exodus that uh, it's, it's better not to steal. It's better to not kill. It's better not to commit adultery. It's better to honor your parents. It's better not to bear false witness. The laws that God gave are embodying a certain code of values and ethics which are determined by God. Now, I mean, think for a moment. If there is no God, if, if God is not the ultimate reality in your worldview, then where do ethics come from? What makes one thing better than another? What would make what Mother Teresa spent her life doing better than what Adolf Hitler spent his life doing. After all, Adolf Hitler, at least for the short life he lived, lived in luxury and power. So I might think that that's a lot more, it's a lot greater than living a long life like Mother Teresa did in poverty, in sickness, and around lepers, and having nothing. What, what would determine that Mother Teresa was a better person than Adolf Hitler? Well, there is a standard by which we judge people's behavior. Killing innocent people is not a high value in that standard. In fact, it's very evil. Helping helpless people and suffering people, that's a very high value in this standard. But where does the standard come from? Now, again, if, it, if we believe in God, we know that this is God's preferences. God prefers that people do a certain thing. God hates certain activities, the Bible says. And he loves other activities that people do. And so the ethics of the theist are determined by what the perception is of what God values. What does God want? Remember, Jesus co condemned the scribes and the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 23. He said, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, for you pay your tithes of mint and anise and cumin, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and uh, faithfulness. Now, what's interesting is they were paying their tithes, which the law required them to do. It was a good thing to do. It even said, you ought to have done this and not left the other undone. In other words, you should have done both. But he says, what you're doing is you're paying your tithes, which you're obligated to do, but you're neglecting more important duties, the weightier matters of the law, he called it. What's that? To be just, to be merciful, to be faithful. These things are more important to God than paying tithes. Now, both were required under the law, but some were more important than others. 
when, when Jesus' disciples were hungry and they were picking grain in the fields in Matthew chapter 12, and this is on a Sabbath day, they're not supposed to do work on the Sabbath, the Pharisees criticized them because they were working on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, didn't you hear what David did when he was hungry, how he went into the temple and ate the showbread, which is not lawful for him to eat? He wasn't a priest, that was only for the priest to eat. He broke that law. But he said, but go and learn what this means. And he quoted Hosea 6.6, 6, I will have mercy rather than sacrifice. Mm -hmm. I will have mercy rather than sacrifice, what God said through the prophet Hosea. It means that, did, now did God not want the Israelites to offer sacrifices? Sure he did. He made a lot of laws about the need to offer sacrifices. But he said, I would rather have you be merciful than have you offer sacrifices. So there's a hierarchy of values. And the only way we know them is if there is a God and if he has revealed himself to us. Now, of course, the Bible claims to be the revelation of God's mind to humanity. It's a very good thing to have. If, if it's a real revelation from a real God, it's the most valuable thing humanity has. It's right here. Because otherwise, we'd be living in a world where there is a God, where he does have something in mind for us, and he is uh, angry at certain activities, and there is a purpose for living, but we would never clue what it is. So having a Bible is the most valuable thing item anyone can have, which is why so many Bible translators have mm -hmm. devoted their lives to the Wycliffe Bible translators and others, and up to tribal people, spending 30 years learning their language and reducing it to writing and, mm -hmm. and translating the Bible so they'll have it, because it is that valuable. Mm -hmm. Now, if there's no God, well, then where do ethics and values come from? Well, just people's preferences, more or less. I mean, an atheist says, no, even an atheist knows that what Adolf Hitler did was wrong. Really? How do we know that? <laughs> Again, if, if the whole standard of, of existence and origins is from evolution, and the way that, that higher animals evolve from lower animals is by killing off their competitors, by taking out the weak so that the strong can continue and evolve further, that's what natural selection is. That, if that's the law of the universe, then why wouldn't it apply to human beings too? Why wouldn't Hitler be doing the great thing. In fact, Hitler himself, I don't know if you're aware of this, actually uh, loved Darwin's theory of evolution and believed that he was helping human evolution along because he was taking uh, the, the disabled, the handicapped people, and killing them in gas chambers, along with gypsies and Jews, whom he also thought were subhuman beings. And he was basically saying, anyone who breeds animals takes the inferior ones and kills them or, and, and, and only breeds the, the superior ones so that you can get a better stock. He says he felt he was helping human evolution along by ridding the gene pool of inferior specimens. Now, if evolution is all there is, then who's to say that isn't the right way to think about things? If human evolution is really the, the highest value, then taking out from the gene pool those who are mentally retarded, let us say, or, you know, pass along, who have some kind of gene that passes along some sickness to others. And, I mean, we'll get those out of, the, out, of the, out of the world. Take those people out. Don't let them reproduce. That's what eugenics was, right? in fact, in the time, same time as Hitler was basically saying, only let the people reproduce who are superior, you know. And to Hitler, that was the tall, blonde, blue-eyed Aryans, although he was none of them above. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> That's interesting. That, that's how he thought about it. Uh, but honestly, I mean, if there is no God, then ethics are whatever you want them to be. Now, again, I read a lot of books by atheists, and there's a lot of them out now. And they, they always deny this. They say, no, we can be moral people. Atheists can be moral people. Religion is what poisons people, makes them evil and hypocritical. It's, it's atheists who are being sincere and honest, and they do... Uh, ben beneficial things to humanity too. I mean, well, maybe they do. But if they have learned that that's a good thing to do, they learn it from theists. Mm -mm. Because atheism would not teach you that. Mm -hmm. Atheism does not in itself dictate moral standards. Unless there's an arbiter who stands above man saying, you shall do this and you shall not do that, mm -hmm. then there's nobody who has any right to tell me what to do at all. You might not like what I do, but that's a different thing than saying that it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And that's what it comes down to. If there's no God, 
in your worldview, then there is no actual absolute moral standard. There's only what most people find distasteful. But what some people find distasteful, other people find very tasteful. So there can't be any one standard that everyone has to be judged by unless there's a, a God. And so non-theistic worldviews really don't have a convincing basis for values and ethics and morals at all. And your worldview, of course, is necessary to, de to determine whether there are such things as ethics and morals. And by the way, there are atheists who have been so honest as to say, it's true, there are no true moral standards. Nietzsche, Nietzsche believed that. Um, that, you know, since there's no God, nothing is wrong. You can do anything you want. He committed suicide to show his freedom to do whatever he wanted. Mm -hmm. wow. mm -hmm. Another question that, of course, your worldview will address is what is human destiny? Mm -hmm. Now, I, I suppose for the non-theist who believes that evolution is, a, is the explanation of origins, it also must, in some measure, determine destiny. So that hum, the human race is destined to become more and more like the, you know, the beings on Star Trek, uh, who are on other planets, who have evolved beyond us, you know. Yeah. But really, the ultimate destiny in a, a non-theistic worldview has got to be oblivion. Actually, in Eastern religions, Hinduism and so forth, that's the Eastern worldview, that, uh, you know, you, the idea is to go through reincarnation a sufficient number of times and improve until you are basically uh, become part of uh, Brahman. You become basically uh, one with the universe, and you lose individuality. So that's kind of like oblivion. If you lose your individual identity, it's like a, they compare with a, a single drop going into the ocean. That drop is still existing, but it's, it has no individual identity. Well, that sounds wonderful. I mean, I, if, if that's the way it is, fine, but that's certainly different than what the Bible teaches or even what atheists believe. Atheists, of course, do believe that evolution will go on as long as it can. But there's going to have to be a stopping point. The sun, for example, is going to eventually burn out. Not anytime soon. Relax. But, <laughs> but it is. So eventually the sun will, will burn out. And, and nothing will be able to live on this planet. We don't know of anything living on any other planet. So, you know, it's oblivion, ultimately. There's no eternal destiny. Now, obviously, the Bible is not the only theistic revelation. The, uh, the Quran claims to be a theistic revelation also. But um, the Bible is more credible for various reasons, which I may talk about a little later. But if the Bible is true, then the ultimate destiny is for people to have eternal rewards for their behavior. Because there is a value system, there is an ethical system, there is a moral system, there is right and wrong. There's a reckoning for those who do right and for those who do wrong. Jesus said that the Son of Man is going to come with, the, with his, uh, the glory of his holy angels and he's going to reward every man according to his works and woman. And so that means that our lives are, there is a destiny and the, the, the rewards are what we will experience in another life after this. There is something more than this life. We all know that there's no justice in this life. Well, I shouldn't say there's no justice, but there's not an awful lot of it. There's an awful lot of injustice. Mm -hmm. And so there is a, an eternal rewarding. And that, and that this, is a, this is something that really uh, stands out as a difference between Eastern religion and biblical religion, too, is how is injustice? Redress. Is there such a thing as justice? Is there a concept of justice? Now, the atheist, let's just talk about what the atheist says for. The atheist believes there's such a thing as justice, but kind of doesn't either. Because, first of all, justice is an abstraction. If you believe something is unjust, where are you getting that from? If you felt like someone treated you unfairly, where'd you get the concept of what's fair and what's not fair? That's an abstraction. They're just doing what they want to do, and you're doing what you want to do, and you end up getting the wrong end of the deal. But what, what, where's their justice or injustice or fairness or unfairness? Where's that concept come from? The atheists really don't have 
a, a transcendent basis for believing in justice at all. And there are some atheists who just believe there is no justice. Uh, Bertrand Russell was an atheist who wrote a, an essay some years ago, many years ago, in the early 20th century, called Why I'm Not a Christian. It's a famous essay. He was a famous atheist. And uh, in it, he said, I'm not convinced by the Christian arguments that, you know, justice is not served in this life, so it must be served in another life. There must be a God who's going to set things right. He says, well, I don't have any reason to believe there's ever going to be anything set right. He said, if I got a, a, a box of oranges in some shipment, and, uh, and I took out the first half dozen, they were all moldy, he says, I wouldn't assume, oh, because these ones are moldy, the good ones must be on the bottom. He said, for all I know, they might be moldy all the way down. You don't assume that just because everything you've examined is bad, that there must be some good somewhere else to, to counterbalance it, he said. He said, if everything we can observe is bad, maybe it's, everything's bad. Maybe there's no justice anywhere. Maybe there never will be justice. Maybe justice doesn't exist, he said. Now, of course, what's interesting here, and he didn't deal with this, and he was supposed to be one of the greatest philosophers of his day, but he wasn't all that logical when he wrote his Why I'm Not a Christian <laughs> on essay. <laughs> If you received a shipment of oranges and you found that the first ones on the top layers were all moldy and bad, how would you know they're bad? Because you know what a good orange is supposed to be like. You don't know that a line is crooked unless you know what a straight line is. <laughs> yeah, you don't know you know what a you don't know what a bad orange is unless you know what a good orange is. If every, if every orange you picked up was squishy and gross, you think, oh, that's how oranges are, I guess. <laughs> no, you know what a good orange is like. So you know, that's a bad one. In other words, you have a concept of what justice is or should be. <laughs> and when you see injustice in the world, you say, that's not right. That wasn't fair. Why? Because you know there is something that is. Now, what's interesting is, if there's no God who determines what's just and what's unjust and what's right and wrong, if we just evolved, why would creatures evolving into conscious beings and, and, and reflective beings evolve this idea of justice, which they crave? Everybody craves justice. We want the world to be a just world. We want to be treated justly ourselves. We'd like to think that we treat others justly. We really want to believe that because if someone says we treat it wrong, the first thing we try to do is justify ourselves and say, no, it wasn't wrong. I had a good reason for that because we want to show that we were not unjust. Justice, we want to be just. We want people to be just. We want the world to be just, but it isn't. Where do we get the idea of justice? Is there any other animal that we know of that has evolved a craving for something that doesn't exist? Animals crave water because there is one. They crave food because there is food. They crave sex because there is sex. They, the, the instincts of animals, as far as we know, they don't crave anything that doesn't exist. Why would we? Why would we crave justice if there's no such thing as justice? Unless there's something in us that God put in us. We're made in God's image and we say, God wants justice. I want justice. There is such a thing. But how is injustice to be Remedy, how's it going to be redressed if good people end up suffering and going to their death suffering? And bad people live happily ever after until they die peacefully in their bed, and that's often happens. That's not just. Well, atheists have no answer for that. They just think, well, there's just never going to be injustice. Deal with it. But Eastern religion and biblical religion are, are different options on this. And Eastern religion believes in something called karma and reincarnation. Now, karma is sort of like, uh, they wouldn't necessarily call it this. I, I would refer to it to make it clear what it is. is like moral credit. We know that if we do something bad, we deserve to be punished. If we do something good, we deserve to be rewarded. That's, that's just, that's understood. In the Eastern religions, they know that too. Now, Dharma, not God, is the one who's determining what's good and bad in Eastern religion. But Dharma still dictate certain duties and certain laws. And if you break those laws, you have bad credit, bad karma. If you do good things, 
such as the, the Dharmic law would, would expect you to do, you acquire good moral credit, you, good karma. Now what happens, everyone knows that some people spend their life being good and they die terribly. They die sick and miserable and, and never, never are rewarded for the goodness. Other people live horribly evil lives and they live comfortably and die comfortably. They never repay for evil. Now, the way the Eastern religion deals with it, well, that person who died, who lived evil and died evil, that person died with a surplus of bad karma. And the person who did all kinds of good things for which he was never repaid dies with a surplus of good karma. Now, so whenever you live your life out, at the end of your life, you've got a surplus of either good or bad karma. And so you're going to be born again into another body, not just once or twice or three times, thousands of times. And every lifetime you live, every time you're reincarnated, you come back in a form that represents the karma surplus that you had before. So if you're really wicked and you lived comfortably, you're going to be reincarnated in a miserable condition, maybe even as an animal or a bug or a human being who's a leper or something like that. You're going to be, you're going to have to pay off your bad karma. And if you don't accumulate any more bad karma in that lifetime, well, if you do, you're going to come back even worse. Eventually, you might come back as a cockroach or a housefly. But if you, if you kind of work off that bad karma by religious activities and so forth that they believe in, then you come back a little better off. And the idea is, in, in Hinduism and, and Buddhism and so forth, is to live in such a way that you acquire more good karma every time you come around, every time you go through. Eventually, you evolve through a, a series of lifetimes into higher and higher uh, forms of, of um, bliss and, and advantage until finally you are absorbed into the universe. Mm -hmm. So it, karma, therefore, Um, it redresses injustices. If your life in this lifetime has been unjust, you'll pay for it or you'll be rewarded for it one or the other in the next life and in the next and so forth down the line. Karma never forgives, by the way. This, there's no, you know, some people say, I think Jesus might have believed in karma and reincarnation. No, he didn't. He believed in forgiveness. He, forgive, he believed in something called resurrection and judgment. Very different. Jesus said in John chapter 5 and verses 28 and 29 he said do not marvel at this the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and will come forth some to a resurrection of life some to a resurrection of condemnation there is a judgment and that is that's the theistic view so the atheists just believe there is no redress for, for injustice it's just life sucks Hinduism believes <laughs> Hinduism and then you die. And then Hinduism believes that you go through many cycles of reincarnation. Eventually all your bad karma gets paid for by misery in later lifetimes, and all your good karma gets rewarded by improvement. And uh, actually many Hindus believe that you will be reincarnated tens of thousands of times. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing how, how many people uh, think that's a good idea. I, you know, I like the idea that I only go through a miserable life one time, <laughs> and if I if I if I played it well, then I'll be rewarded for eternity for that. You know, yeah. uh, the idea that you have to come back to this world, which isn't seemingly getting any better, <laughs> and have to keep coming back thousands of times. I mean, what's it going to be like in you know, twenty five, twenty five? You know, um, I you know I don't know if I want to be here now, but that's no I have no choice in the matter. I don't reject karma and reincarnation because it, I don't like the idea, although I don't. But I reject it because it's a contrary to what Jesus said. Uh, Jesus said, blessed are those who are persecuted and suffer for righteousness sake. Karma never makes anyone suffer for righteousness sake. They suffer for bad karma. They don't suffer for good karma. You can suffer for the sake of being right and good in Jesus' ethic. And you can be forgiven instantly for things you've done bad. And, and there's no endless series of reincarnations. There's one life, one death, one resurrection and judgment. It says in 
Hebrews 9, I think it's verse 27, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. So different worldviews have different ways of talking about how, what human destiny is like and how these kinds of issues are done. Now, in our, in our world, uh, it looks to me like most of you are from Western countries. Uh, in the West, the biblical theistic worldview was dominant for hundreds of years. And uh, beginning in the, well, probably beginning with the uh, Enlightenment period, uh, people began to embrace atheism somewhat more. Um, it was always hard to embrace atheism because you still have to explain where everything came from. And without God in the picture, that's not at all easy to answer. But, uh, of course, Darwin came up with the theory of evolution. We'll say more about that after we take a break and come back. But um, the world began to embrace an alternative worldview. Initially, it was that there is a God, but that he didn't do much more than just make things. Or he may have used evolution to make things. And more recently, it's become sort of a common assumption that there is no God. And that belief in God is similar to believing in the flying spaghetti monster or in Santa Claus and the Tooth Fairy. This is what it's like. People like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris and Christopher Hitchens, famous atheist writers in recent times, have said. Uh, of course, therefore, it begins. The, the society begins to just kind of have this hunch that people who believe in God are living in a fantasy land. Uh, that belief in God is really kind of a superstition. Now, there's still a lot of people in Western civilization that believe there's a God. But more and more, especially in Europe and, and the United States, uh, there are people who are at least identifying themselves as atheists. I think they still pray secretly when they're in trouble, but, <laughs> but they would, you know, it's hip. It's chic to be an atheist today. And so atheism, or it's just not even thinking about God at all. I mean, once you've decided there's no God, you don't have to think about God at all. There begins to be just this narcissism that replaces it. And, and so you'll find that a lot of people don't share your worldview, assuming you have a Christian worldview. Now, many Christians don't. There have been surveys done, alarming surveys, of kids um, in Christian uh, families who were raised in church and asked them what they believe about this, that, and the other thing, and found out that they get answers totally contrary to what the, the biblical worldview is. Mm -hmm. We can't assume anymore, because of this blurring of realities in, in the modern world, uh, we can't assume that Christians even know what the Christian worldview is, or that they think along those lines. It's one thing to define a Christian worldview, which I've been kind of doing here, but it's an entirely different thing to have that really be the, the grid through which you see everything. Mm -hmm. You may say, I can give a definition of the worldview in the Bible, and I believe it's true. But once you've said you believe it, you go on and live in the real world according to the world grid that you've been fitted with, which may or may not be the Christian one. If you came up through public schools, there's a very good chance that you've been, uh, well, at your age, probably brought up under a, a naturalistic worldview which is atheistic. Uh, there's another possibility in that you've been brought up under postmodern worldview. Let me just real quickly talk about these, then we'll take a break, okay? Um, let me tell you about four major worldviews. One is the, uh, we say the Judeo-Christian. We say Judeo-Christian because the Jews gave us the Old Testament and the Christians gave us the new, and so this is the biblical worldview. And by the way, uh, Muslim worldview would be similar because Muhammad borrowed his ideas partly from Judaism, partly from uh, Christianity, and, and partly from his own imagination. But nonetheless, the, the belief that there's a, a one transcendent God who made everything, which is the starting point of the theistic worldview, is also embraced by Muslims. And also by, you know, a lot of cultists, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses and, and those kind of groups. Now, I think we've pretty well defined what the Judeo-Christian worldview is. The ultimate reality is God. Origins, God designed everything for a purpose. There's purpose in life, and the purpose is to fill the reason that God made things for. Uh, where do values come from? They come from God. 
God's own heart and mind dictate what we see as good and bad and desirable and undesirable. Uh, what is the destiny of man? Well, it's to be uh, eventually raised from the dead, judged by God, and rewarded eternally for, uh, for the things we do. That's the Judeo-Christian worldview. There is also, what I've been talking about the Eastern uh, worldview, this would be the Indian religions mostly, that have you know, permeated Asia. Uh, let's see, if I get there, okay. This is called monism. It's also called pantheism. Uh, pantheism and monism are kind of different aspects of the same thing. This is the basic worldview of the East. Monism means all is one. Everything is one. And the, um, the goal, ultimately, of humanity is to be, you know, at one with everything. Um, to become part of, uh, part of the whole. Not, it's, it's a very anti-individualistic worldview, although you have individual duties and individual reincarnations and things. Basically, you want to lose your individuality eventually and just be absorbed into the one thing. Um, there actually was a, on YouTube, you can find this, that the Dalai Lama, the head of Tibetan Buddhism, actually was on a Western TV talk show. And the guy who was interviewing him thought he'd tell a joke to kind of, kind of, uh, I guess, break the ice with him. It didn't go over real well with the Dalai Lama, but the, the joke was the Dalai Lama went into a pizza parlor and said, make me one with everything. Uh, <laughs> the Dalai Lama, the guy told the joke to the Dalai Lama, oh he didn't get it. He, he didn't get it, you know, make me one with everything. I mean, but, because he didn't understand pizzas, you know, but, but that's, that's the goal of Eastern religions, become one with everything, basically. There's no God to be one with, so you've got to be one with the everything, the one. Monism means all is one. Pantheism is no name for it. Pantheism means that God, everything is God. The tree is God, the rocks are God, the planets are God, you're God, I'm God, everyone's God. The floor is God. Uh, everything's God, because everything's one. God is just the one. It's not a personal being. That's the Eastern uh, worldview, which many people hold. And by the way, New Age people, have adopted a, a very large amount of this. Uh, the New Age movement is a combination of ideas taken from Eastern monism and some from Christianity, some from the occult, a bunch of different things, so-called New Age, introduced into Western civilization, uh, popularity for reincarnation, karma, and, and Eastern ideas like that. Then, of course, there's naturalism. Now, to say that someone's a naturalist you know, I think that a naturalist is someone who goes out and uh, enjoys nature. <laughs> and that is one meaning of the word naturalist, but this is uh, metaphysical naturalism is the idea that there is nothing but nature. There is no supernatural. Therefore, there's no God. There's no immortal soul. There's no angels. There's no demons. There's no devil. There's nothing, nothing supernatural exists. Only what can be studied by scientists. And this is also sometimes called scientism. Now, scientism isn't just that you're a scientifically minded person. Scientism is the assumption that science is everything, basically. That you, there is nothing which, which cannot be studied by science. Now, science only studies natural phenomena, the laws of nature, things like that, processes of nature. But, um, you know, scientism, of course, would leave out things like philosophy and ethics and Things like that that science can't science can't discover love as an as an abstract phenomenon. I mean, science there's no law of, the, of nature that you discover it by no experiments. I mean, you could observe love, but you couldn't prove that's what it is scientifically. That's a different realm. You certainly can't prove God. But see, they, they don't want to because there's not there is no God. Naturalism is atheism. Naturalism is also called materialism. Again, we might think of materialism as someone who's greedy and has a lot of money, but materialism is, like naturalism, a belief that there's nothing but material 
thing, the material world. There's no non-material, there's no spirits, for example. And so <clears throat> that's naturalism. Um, and then the fourth view is mm -hmm. postmodernism. Now this is actually very arguably the uh, the present mindset of the West more than anything. Postmodernism is after modernism. Naturalism is considered to be modernism. The modern age is the scientific age. The modern age is the rational age. The modern age has dominated from the time of the Enlightenment until until the sometime in the 20th century. But what has risen is postmodernism. And this has risen among people who say, there, how, how are we to say there's anything that's absolutely true and absolutely real? Even science can't be trusted absolutely. Uh, because what you think is true, the person sitting next to you may not think is true. And if you were raised in America, let us say, you might be raised to be a believer in God. Whereas if you were raised in India, you'd be raised to be a Hindu. Or if you were <clears throat> raised in a tribal group in Africa, you might be an anim animist or some other you know, kind of strange pantheistic thing. Uh, therefore, they say there's no absolute truth. Nobody can judge anyone else's ideas of truth. There, there's nothing absolute. Of course, the old canard is, uh, are you absolute? Are you sure about that? <laughs> Are there absolutely no absolutes? Because, of course, the statement itself is an absolute statement. It's self-defeating. It's self-contradicting. To say, no statement is absolutely true. Well, then the one you just made is an absolute true, because that was a statement, too. So uh, it's self-defeating. But nonetheless, postmodernism is not really a rational view. It's about feeling. It's about how you feel about things, not what can be proven scientifically. The, the very the, the modern uh, gender dysphoria that we see in the Western world is a product of postmodernism. They're saying, okay, just because you were born with the uh, the genitalia of a boy and a Y chromosome too, which technically makes you male, that doesn't mean you're really male. What do you identify yourself as? Do you feel like you're a female? Do you really feel more like you're a, a, a girl born in a boy's body? Well, then people should honor that. They, they, they shouldn't insult you by calling you a boy just because scientists can prove you are a boy, but who cares what science thinks? It's what you think that matters. And in fact, the whole world should bow down to your private feelings about this, and they should call you by the, we should change the whole English language, really or the whole language of every culture, and not use the regular gender pronouns for you because you might not feel comfortable being that. And so, I mean, this whole trend, which is dominant in our society at this very moment, mm -hmm. uh, is, is very much a, the, a, a manifestation of postmodernism. There's nothing absolutely true. There are no absolute boys and girls. There's 400 genders. <laughs> and. You know, if, on this view, you are what you feel. You are what you believe. Now, the problem with this, there's many problems with it. First of all, it's fantasy. But one of the problems with it is that uh, you cannot, therefore, uh, critique somebody's views without being a personal attack against them because they are their views. Their views are them. There used to be a time, uh, even even the natural naturalism and Judeo-Christian uh, worldviews welcomed debate about things because we believe there's absolute truth, and we know that there is an absolute reality, and everybody's own opinions approximate it somewhat and and, and miss it by some. We're we're not all 100 percent right. Maybe no one is 100 percent right, but someone is closer to right than others. So let's debate this. Let's discuss this. Let's see what the evidence leads to. Let's see what the best arguments support. And we can find then that there is a truth that we all will be subject to. We may not like it, it may not be what we feel, but we have minds that are able to reason things out logically and say, okay, obviously this is true. 
how, whether I like it or not, it's true. <coughs> and if I'm wrong about something, a person who points out to me that I'm wrong is doing me a favor. They're not attacking me. My goal is to believe what's true, not to believe whatever I want to believe. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if you can find something wrong with what I say, and you point out to me that it's wrong, I don't take that as a personal attack. Why should I? I, I want, and I assume you want too, to know it's true. So why shouldn't we do a favor to each other and point out where you're being wrong or where I'm being wrong? Mm -hmm. But you see, in postmodernism, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You're a hater. If you don't agree that homosexual marriage is a good thing, you're a hater. Yeah. Well, why? I don't hate anybody. Oh, you hate me because you don't agree with me. Mm -hmm. No, I don't hate you. Yes, you attack me because that's who I am. You're attacking my position, my belief, my feeling. And that's what makes me who I am, and, and therefore you're attacking me. Therefore we have the snowflake generation, as they're called. People who are so fragile, you can't say anything that might be, a, might be viewed as a microaggression against them. <laughs> On the college campus, they have like safe places. They might have to have a crying room where if somebody, if somebody uses the wrong pronoun, for you, you have to go and cry your eyes out, you know, to get over it. Uh, you might need a comfort, you know, animal in the classroom with you because the teacher said something you don't agree with. And I mean, it's like making snowflakes is the term that's used for this for, for people who are just easily crushed, easily destroyed, easily melt down because they aren't, they don't believe there's absolute truth anymore. Therefore, I just got to find my truth. And when you try to tell someone like that about Christ, I might say, well, that's your truth. I've got my truth. Jesus is your truth. Mm -hmm. My truth is something else. And they think that's entirely justifiable. But that's because of the postmodern world view. There's no truth. And of course, all of these views would somewhat differ with that because they believe there is such a thing as truth. They just differ as to what the truth is. Postmodernism is... Uh, is the way toward total irrationalism mm -hmm. and toward total what you feel is all that matters. Mm -hmm. And that's frankly a very scary thing because yeah. eventually then ethics boils down to whatever you feel like doing mm -hmm. is right. Mm -hmm. You want to kill somebody because they're, you know, you want to abort the baby because it's inconvenient. You don't feel good about having a baby. Well, kill it. There's nothing wrong. How could, how could anyone say that's wrong? No one can say what's wrong for you. And so the world views that people have, a lot of times, like I said, they're not, they don't even think about what their world views. They just look at the world through it and make the assumptions about everything based on these foundational assumptions of the world view. And so when you come to Genesis chapter 1, you find that the world view of theism, frankly, is the most, frankly, it's the most rational world view there is. It's the most self-consistent. It doesn't have internal contradictions. Some people think it does, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's what we find in the Bible. And as I said, if there is a God, and if reality is about finding his will and living according, then having a, a book that is a genuine revelation from God that tells us those things is the, is the greatest thing we could ever hope to have. Mm -hmm. I, I know some Christians raised in Christian members say, well, I, I gave up on Christianity because I just figured there's so many different beliefs out there. What are the chances I would have been born in a family that had the right one? Well, again, that's postmodernism. If you wonder whether the family you were raised in had the right views on it, test them. Check the evidence. Reason it out. You don't, you don't just have to say, well, you know, if I was born in India, I'd be a Hindu. If I was born in somewhere else, I'd be a Buddhist. I, you know, I, well, that doesn't mean you have to be one. There are Hindus and Buddhists who become Christians. There are Christians who become Hindus and Buddhists. There are Jews who become Buddhists. There's, I mean, people do change as they look at evidence. But the point is, uh, we need to understand there are absolutes. And the Bible is there to tell us what the absolute truth is. And so as you study through the Bible, you're going to be getting God's revelation of these absolutes. Okay, we need to take a break here. And uh, okay. come back in 10 minutes. Yeah, guys, just take a 10-minute break and be back here at 11.40. Oh, also, we put a water cooler behind you guys, so you can get water in here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.